Uh, good morning, everybody. I'll be talking on the practical use of finer drops. It's more of a review type of a lecture, not a hardcore scientific or physiological lecture by Mauricio. I have no conflict of interest, and I would like to start uh, the best way to start a lecture is a case summary that many of you have seen such kind of patient of young male with febrile illness and body ache. On day four, develops petechy jaundice and streak hematemesis, then develops hypotension on day five, lactate increase, SCVO2 decrease, fluid resuscitation in eight hours, he received 4.6 liters of fluid, and MAP is just hovering around 58 millimeters of mercury. This is, uh, obviously, we are talking about a severe dengue infection, which is very common in Southeast Asia, even in India, it's very common, in, especially in monsoon rainy season. The echocardiography in this patient showed four chamber dilatation, global biventricular hypokinesia, mitral and tricuspid regurgitation, pericardial effusion, early signs of tamponade. Hemoglobin is dropped, as we know, there is hemoconcentration in dengue, but in this case, there is a drop in hemoglobin, platelets dropped, and there is a coagulopathy. Now the question is, which, what kind of shock we are treating with? And it's a jigsaw puzzle, because there is a hypovolemia because of hemorrhage, so we are dealing with hypovolemic shock. There is a cardiomyopathy, there is myocarditis because of dengue, so we are probably dealing with pump failure, there is dengue myocarditis. There is a pericardial effusion and right, right atrium has started compressing in diastole, so we are probably talking about obstructive shock, and there is significant capillary leak in dengue, which is a pathophysiology of dengue, so we are probably talking about a distributive shock. So this is the classic model of hinshaw cox physiological model published in 1972 of four kinds of shock, which I will talk mainly on pump failure, that is cardiogenic shock, and some slides on distributive shock in my talk of practical use of inotropes. But before I start, I would like to show this elegant review article by a father of hemodynamic monitoring, Max Harivel, published in JAMA in 1975. The two statements are very important, that there is no specific indication for routine use of vasoactive agents, that is beta adrenergic at that time. Since vasoactive agent drugs frequently intensify the fundamental defect, as we discussed about adrenaline just now, for perfusion failure, there is selective rather than routine employment of these agents. So Max Harivel was really a, a, a seer who, who could see the future after 40 years. So just talking about inotropes, revising our physiology, the inotropes are epinephrine, dobutamine, levosimendan, and milrinone. The important point I would like to highlight is levosimendan has got very long half-life. Active metabolite can stay in circulation up to 80 hours, rest others are short-acting agents. The best use of inotrop in today's practice in 2017 and probably acute decompensated heart failure and cardiogenic shock. So this is Alexander Mebaza's uh, alarm HF registry, which showed that after propensity matching of more than 2,000 patients, the risk of death was much, much associated with use of epinephrine and norepinephrine. But there's a contrast in the logic because this, only the sick patients receive norepinephrine and, and epinephrine. The less sick patients do not receive that. But if we adjust the propensity scoring, the dopamine and dopamine has got less chance of death, but the levosimendan was the drug which has probably no effect or had slightly beneficial effect in acute decompensated heart failure in this registry. And the second best use of inotrop in today's practice is cardiogenic shock. This is European Society of Cardiology statement uh, position paper on management of cardiogenic shock. The first two interventions, obviously, fluid optimization. I'm not saying fluid resuscitation, fluid optimization, and then use of norepinephrine, as Daniel's paper in 2010 showed as, though it was uh, comparing the norepinephrine and dopamine, in the subgroup analysis, the cardiogenic shock patients were better with norepinephrine. And then after optimization of vasopressor and fluid, dobutamine, which is the commonest agent used all over the world, can be started, and levosimendan may be better. That's what the European Society of Cardiology has proposed. Then we have got a good paper in intensive care medicine, which is a multidisciplinary uh, task force publication from cardiologists, intensivists, cardiac surgeons, and pulmonologists came together and talked about management of cardiogenic shock. And pr primary comparison of dobutamine versus levosimendan. Levosimendan is now in there for almost 15 years. And levosimendan found out to be better in terms, in patients with post-operative stunning of myocardium, those patients having chronic heart failure, and those patients who are already on beta blocker for their heart failure management. But the moral of the story was avoid epinephrine in these patients because it was associated with significant mortality. Let's start with individual agents of inotropic agents, dobutamines. The story started in almost 1979-80. This was the probably first paper on dobutamine in clinical trial, which was recommended at that time of acute heart failure without hypotension, and it increased LV filling pressure that was proposed at that time. 
Then we soon reached the meta-analysis of dopamine in 2012, after 40 years of 14 studies, 6, 673 patients. And if you see the forest curve, forest, curve, <coughs> forest plot, uh, there is equipoise between dobutamine or placebo or dobutamine with no dobutamine. So we really don't know whether dobutamine reduces mortality, but in, in fact, this paper or this meta-analysis has raised a question whether dobutamine increases mortality in the patients with acute decompensated heart failure. About milrinone, uh, milrinone is not very popular in, in India at, at least, but I don't know about uh, Southeast Asia, this part of the uh, world. But it started in 1980 to 1983. It significantly reduced left ventricular end diastolic pressure, and it increased left ventricular ejection fraction. This was the initial studies on milrinone. And then we traveled this uh, journey of almost 30 years on milrinone, and this is a meta-analysis on milrinone with 31 trials, almost 1,600 patients. And the conclusion of this meta-analysis was which cannot be recommended or cannot be refuted. So the, probably it's still open. The milrinone is more popular in cardiac surgeons and cardiac anesthetists, especially in perioperative area. I would like to uh, highlight this slide with uh, epinephrine. Uh, this is published recently last year in critical care. It is the current real-life use of vasopressors and inotropes in cardiogenic shock. Adrenaline use is associated with excess organ injury and mortality. So this is a very good observational study, I would say, with 200 patients with propensity score matching, and epinephrine has the highest chance of death. So in cardiogenic shock especially, we should not use epinephrine as an inotropic agent, where we have got three other inotropic agents available with us. The saga of liver cement dance started in 1995. Uh, this was the first dose fixation study in 1995. Uh, then came the famous Rusland study in European Heart Journal. It was, of course, a safety, uh, safety study which showed liver cement done is a safe agent. In 2005, uh, Adria Morelli used in even septic shock patients. And in 2007, the survived trial, which is a famous trial on liver cement done published in JAMA. But unfortunately, it did not show any survival benefit. And in 2015, we had meta-analysis on almost 88 trials on liver cement done, which is the most popular drug in uh, Europe about inotropy. But the saga did not stop there. In the last two years, in 2016 and 17, we had three important publications on liver cement done. These all trials with leopards, leocats, and cheetah. Uh, I don't know why liver cement done is associated with uh, tigers and canine group of uh, animals, but these are the names of the trials, and all three trials are published in New England Journal. The first study is from uh, UK. I am a little worried about, uh, skeptic about the design of the study because liver cement done, the title of the study is liver cement done for the prevention of acute organ dysfunction in sepsis. And in this design, there was no parameters of cardiac index, cardiac output, or stroke volume, or a CVO2 was used to randomize the patient of whether to give liver cement done or not liver cement done. It was just liver cement done started for all septic shock patients versus placebo started in other half of the patients. So of course, it's a negative study. There is no benefit. Then these are the two studies, Leo Katz and Cheetah, which published just last two months. Uh, there, they talk mainly about liver cement done in perioperative area, especially cardiac surgery. One is, in one study, it was started before surgery, and in one study, it was started after the surgery. But there is no much survival benefit of using liver cement done in perioperative cardiac surgery patients. There is a future novel drug, which is in the pipeline, may come in a few years, like uh, Omecamtiv, which is a selective cardiac myosin activator, which stimulates actin myosin cross bridging. There is a small paper published in Lancet five years, six years back, but we have not heard a story ahead about this drug. Coming back to inotropes and its practical use in 2017, there are, besides acute decompensated heart failure and cardiogenic shock, there are a few select indications of use of inotropic agent like dobutamine or levosimendan or milrinone in our day to day practice which we might not get a large randomized studies on these small uh, diagnoses, but they are important because every day we manage these patients. Right heart failure presents with maybe acute and chronic or maybe acute heart failure. The initial treatment is treat the primary cause like pulmonary embolism or hypoxia-related vasoconstriction. Fluid, resus fluid restriction, not the resuscitation, because we know fluid will exacerbate the problem. Stabilize the blood pressure with norepinephrine, and there are select class of patients or few patients who would benefit with inotropic agents even in right heart failure. Scorpion bite, which is a review article published in 2014 in India and in many other countries, scorpion bite is still a problem with excessive adrenergic and cholinergic crisis. These patients come with massive pulmonary edema and cardiogenic shock, where dobutamine is a choice of agent to treat the cardiogenic shock and pulmonary edema in these patients. 
we are doing a lot of cardiac transplant nowadays in, in Asia as well. Uh, so there are many patients who are listed for cardiac transplant who are in a waiting period to get a cadaveric heart. So many of these patients are put on milrinone pump or weekly dobutamine or maybe alternate day dobutamine or levosimendan infusion just to stabilize their heart or maintain them alive till they get a cadaveric heart. So the anotropes are used in these patients as well. Myocardial separation, which is a real life problem, acute problem in drug toxicity, especially with calcium channel blockers and beta blockers. Aluminum phosphide poisoning, which is common in North Indian states where it is common pesticide used in a wheat, uh, wheat crop. Then we are using a lot of oncological drugs nowadays uh, with lot many new molecules in oncology. The doxorubicin and donorubicin are old one, but the monoclonal antibodies like trastuzumab or small molecule tyrosine kinase inhibitors like imatinib, all of them are associated with myocardial separation and few of them may come to your ICU for acute heart failure. In, so inotropy has got definite role in these patients. Just one slide on the oldest inotrope, which is the oral and also IV form, but nobody uses infusion of these drugs. The story started in 1785, almost 300 years back. William Withering prescribed the fox glow leaves for those patients who had got significant edema, pedal edema and anasarca, and they got better with the fox glow extract. And this was nothing but a digoxin, and probably the diagnosis of dropsy was congestive cardiac failure. But still in 2012, European Society of Cardiology has placed digoxin as an agent in patients who have got low ejection fraction and who has got fast ventricular rate because of atrial fibrillation. Digoxin is still a choice to manage these patients. Perioperative optimization, a lot of people, there was a lot of enthusiasm after uh, early goal-directed therapy of use of inotropes in perioperative area. And these are the three best papers which I could find that use of perio dobutamine or any other inotropic agent in perioperative area, but unfortunately, none of them has shown any significant outcome. So there is no survival benefit or there is no uh, morbidity and mortality benefit of this. So routine use of dobutamine or levosimendan for non-cardiac surgery perioperative is not recommended today. Uh, this is a strange, not strange entity, but uh, our chairperson, uh, Jolly Thebul, uh, he was very young at that time. He's still young by heart, but chronologically he was 34-year-old uh, at that time when working in Paris, has described the entity called winning-induced left ventricular failure. So this uh, very good graph you can see. Those patients who received, sorry, those patients who received spontaneous breathing, their uh, pulmonary capillary wage pressures just jumped from, say, 15 to 20 to 40 and even high. So this is uh, a problem with left ventricular feeling, and this was attributed to multifactorial etiology, which Dr. Tebul will ask you if you ask any question in the discussion. But the corollary of this, the paper, uh, Jolly published this paper, is my paper 20 years ahead, which the two comments are very important for us. If you find the problem of winning induced cardiac dysfunction, and the choice is probably levosimendan because winning failure from mechanical ventilation due to dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, a successful use of levosimendan has been shown in this paper. And a dobutamine is not a good choice as per our author who is our shared person. So uh, winning induced left ventricular failure, you may think of using levosimendan as an inotropic agent. Sepsis and myocardial dysfunction, the last few slides of my talk. Uh, we know that sepsis also affects uh, my, myocardial activity. And this was an excellent paper by Joe Perillo almost 30 years back, which showed that there is diverse response to septic shock as our heart goes. It's a reversible kind of myocardial separation. It increases the ventricular volumes and drop in left ventricular failure. But a surprising fact was those patients who developed increase in ventricular volume and drop in left ventricular, fail, left ventricular ejection fraction were more survivors. And those in whom left ventricular ejection fraction remained static, and there was no ventricular dilatation were non-survivors. So this was a probably an adaptation of our body, of our autonomic circulation, to the sepsis stress. And this was proven not by echocardiography, but this was proven by radionuclear studies at that time. So we know sepsis affects heart as well. Then this is an elegant study by Anton Viabaro from France, which is a review article and has shown us that sepsis affects all kinds of heart function, left ventricular systolic function, left ventricular diastolic function, even right ventricular function, and a futuristic tool of echocardiography, maybe speckle tracking of echocardiography, which is still futuristic, but 
the point is left ventricular systolic function is more important here to study. As we know, sepsis affects left ventricular systolic function, which is shown by reduced cardiac output. It may be initial phase of cardiac output is reduced, but it may, it may later on be reduced, or it may be inappropriate increase in cardiac output. The body demands more, but the supply from heart is less, so there is demand supply mismatch, and our SCVO2 is low. Echocardiography, if you see low ejection fraction, then these patients probably may get benefit from dobutamine. That's the point I would like to stress, that if you can show left ventricular systolic dysfunction in a septic patient, and if there are parameters which show there is a circulatory demand or demand supply mismatch, there is a role of using inotropy in even septic shock. As Maurizio showed the CAT study from Jilalianan, I won't repeat this, but the, it is the comparison between epinephrine and combination of norepinephrine plus dobutamine, but there is no survival benefit. Both agents were just the same. And the most important topic of discussion today, probably in this meeting and maybe meetings to come in future, what, what will happen with early goal-directed therapy? So the story started in 2001 with Emmanuel Rivers published early goal-directed therapy for septic shock patients, and then a series of Three publications came in New England Journal, one from Australia, one from US, and one from UK, which refuted the hypothesis of early go directed therapy. But I would like to highlight some uh, understanding of these papers. So in Emmanuel Rivers paper, if you see these uh, numbers, the fluid resuscitation before enrollment were almost similar, maybe two liters to 2.5 liters of fluid. Mean arterial pressure almost similar. Hematocrit was almost similar, but the difference lies in SCVO2. In Emmanuel Reverse study, it was first AGDT study, the SCVO2 was 49%. So this was definitely demand supply mismatch in the body. They were sick patients. And if you see the process trial patients arise and promise, their SCVO2 was somewhere around 70%. So they were probably already optimized patients were enrolled in the study. So any inotropy or any therapy might not do any effect on these patients because they are probably pre-optimized patients. So these three, three trials, ROMIS, ARISE, and PROCESS, probably not refute the idea of early goal-directed therapy and use of dobutamine and Paxil because in Manny Rivers' paper in EGDT, dobutamine and Paxil volume were given to the, in, a, in attempt to target SCVO2 more than 70%. So there is still role of inotropy even in septic shock. Then if you are using uh, echocardiography and routine cardiac monitoring, then these are the patients on left lower quartile where ejection fraction is low and your cardiac index is low. There is some place to use inotropy in these patients as well. If your ejection fraction is normal or, uh, and your cardiac output is above normal or normal, then this inotropic agent won't help. But in this quartile, inotropy agent, even in septic shock, might help. Then if you are using uh, advanced hemodynamic tools like pulmonary vascular permeability index or global end diastolic volume index, you may differentiate the, the patients who will benefit from inotropy or not. Then the position statement from European Society, which Maurizio just said, but he talked about vasoconstrictor. I would show the two statements about vas uh, inotropes, which suggest the inotropic agent should be added when the altered cardiac function is <coughs> accompanied by low or inadequate cardiac output and a science of tissue hypoperfusion persists. That's very important, and after preload, preload optimization. So you have to optimize the preload, start vasopressor, and then think of using inotrop. We recommend no inotrop for isolated impaired cardiac dysfunction. So if there is only low ejection fraction or low cardiac output, doesn't mean you should start inotrop. You have to have parameters which show there is less perfusion to body, then only you can use inotrop in these patients. So best use of inotropes in 2017, coming to my last two slides. The best use in ICO day-to-day -day practice is still acute decompensated heart failure, which they are the choice of agent. Of course, you have to treat ischemia, arrhythmia, and infection, which are the commonest cause of acute decompensation of heart failure. The choices are dobutamine, levosimendan, and milrinone, of which levosimendan uh, is a still popular. We use routinely levosimendan in our, in our ICU. And it has shown to be beneficial in patients who have post-operative stunning of left ventricular failure, those who are already on beta blockers because of their congestive cardiac failure, and they reduce pulmonary hypertension as well. So milrinone also reduce pulmonary hypertension. So there are three choices to use inotropy and active decompensated heart failure. And the next best use of inotrope is cardiogenic shock with tissue hypoperfusion. You have to document tissue hypoperfusion in cardiogenic shock. Then the story is, Avoid epinephrine and dopamine. You can, not epinephrine as a vasopressor. You can use dobutamine, levosimendan, and milrinone in these patients as well. So my last slide, 
The practical use of Inotrop today is you may use any protocol of reverse EGDT, table money algorithm of approach to shock, Vincent Pinsky protocol, or SACP protocol, but you have to remember this. There is an individualized decision making, and one size do not fit all. Use echocardiography and multiple dynamic hemodynamic variables to decide whether individual patient will benefit from inotropy or not. Thank you very much.